and you end up with tests that you have to maintain that are um, duplicated. So enter property-based testing. And for property-based tests, instead of testing specific instances, like if one goes in, one comes out, if three goes in, fizz comes out, if five comes in, buzz comes out, you test the general behavior. So in the case of fizz buzz, the general behavior would be if a multiple of three comes in, fizz comes out. If a multiple of five comes in, buzz comes out. There's another rule in fizz buzz. If it's a multiple of three and five, then it should return fizz buzz. So let's adjust this, this test. Uh, if a multiple of three comes in, it should start with fizz. If a multiple of five comes in, it should end with buzz. So you get this coverage. And it works because property-based tests, and by the way, it's not a call to throw out your existing tests, rely on something called generators. Generators are, um, it's like fuzzy testing. It, it generates random, more or less random results. These are biased inputs, uh, by which I mean they tend to shift towards known edge cases. So if you have a, a generator for a number, it will try zero first, and it will try minus one first, and it will try one first, and then it will try the lar largest integer and the smallest integer. And, and then it will start um, randomly generating other numbers. So it's, it's a bit, it, it shifts towards the, like the obvious stuff. And even before you start thinking about properties, just being able to fuzz these uh, inputs is already pretty valuable. Common built-in generators, so you can generate numbers, floats. Most libraries, uh, most uh, property-based uh, property test libraries support these um, basic, basic types. Booleans, strings of any type can be ASCII strings, could be really weird Unicode strings, it'll generate huge strings, small, small strings, uh, collections, an array of something else, for example, an array of strings or an array of numbers or an array of combination of these things, uh, even functions, functions that take certain number of, of arguments and, and return certain values. It, it's pretty sophisticated stuff, and it, like the more sophisticated these libraries are, the, the more complex objects you can generate out, even out of the box, and you can compose them too. So for example, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm generating a person record. Uh, for starters, I'll have an email, which is an ASCII string up to, for example, 32 characters. Uh, and I have a mapping function because I, I want it to be like a valid email. And then you generate a record with a random first name, which can be any string can be an empty string, can be uh, like a huge string, anything. Last name and age, which is would be a number between zero and 100, and then the email above. And every time you use this person arbitrary, which is, these are called arbitrators, by the way, uh, in, in, your, um, in your tests, you're, you're providing your properties with this, these things. And every time the property runs, which is by default, in most libraries, about 100 times, it will generate 100 person records, and it will run your, um, your tests using these inputs. You can also um, apply a filter on the generator. So for example, if you want just people with an age over 18, so you have um, a bunch of uh, records for adult users, you can do something like this. Uh, Bear in mind that having very uh, restrictive constraints on this generation might delay your tests because it has to go back and try to recreate something that's valid. Uh, so try not to abuse this. So okay, you, you have these generators, you're generating stuff. So about a concrete example, I mentioned FizzBuzz, but perhaps one of the easiest ones to understand is something that you've probably learned about in high school is the properties of addition. And so you know there's commutativity, associativity, et cetera, and these are pretty, pretty basic stuff. 
And these are the same kinds of properties that you would test in a property-based testing scenario. So for example, and th these examples are in a property-based uh, testing library called FastCheck, which is a library for JavaScript and TypeScript. But every language, I'll give you a list at the end, virtually every language has something similar. So commutativity, it's you create two floats and you add them in different ways and you compare them. So this, this is different from your approach or normal unit test based approach where you provide two numbers and then you expect a result. Because these numbers are randomized, you can't do that. You have to compare it against something that is like a general behavior, not a specific instance of, of, uh, of the functions or the system to behavior. Same thing, associativity, create three floats and add them in different ways, they should be the same. Uh, the null element, and this you can actually compare with the result because anything plus zero is, is the original number. Uh, the successor, it's always greater than the original number when you added one or anything. Uh, the inverse, again, you can compare with a specific result because any number minus itself is zero and distributivity and so on, so. Oh, do you, this is all very nice, you know, but you're not writing tests for, for uh, add functions in your code. You will probably want to use it for something that's actually useful. So how do you determine properties that you might want to test? So this, this came up in the, in the addition example it's commutativity and dissociativity. This is multiple ways to get to the same point. So if you have two functions that are complementary, when you call them in whatever sequ sequence, you end up with the same result. So you can write a property a test that says, okay, uh, f or g after f is the same as f after g, and this holds true for, or should hold true, if, if that's your property, it should hold true for all cases. Round trip tests, if you have a function that is the inverse of each other. So for example, serialize and deserialize. If you serialize something to JSON, when you deserialize it, you should end up with the original object and you can test that. It doesn't matter what the object is, it doesn't matter what the JSON payload is, this should all true. For example, getters and setters, if you set an, a value, you should be able to get that value. It doesn't matter what the value is. So you're not thinking about concrete examples again. Invariance, stuff that does never changes. Uh, suppose you're writing a sort function. Uh, when you're sorting an array, the size of the array never changes. With FizzBuzz itself, if you provide a range of numbers in FizzBuzz, the length of, of the resulting array never changes even though there was some transform going on. So mapping functions, uh, should ensure that, for example, invariants uh, like length um, are maintained. Idempotence too, setters, setting the same value, doesn't matter how many times, shouldn't change anything. Sorting again, sorting the same array multiple times, shouldn't again, shouldn't change anything. Most filters shouldn't change anything. If you filter an array or a collection, for some condition, applying it multiple times shouldn't change it. And this is something that you can, can test as well. You test a function over an arbitrary um, value, and then you compare it with function of the function of the arbitrary value, it should be the same. This is a pretty interesting use case for property-based tests. So suppose you're you're redeveloping or recreating a legacy application that doesn't have any tests, but you want to make sure that you're implementing the same thing generally. It's, it's a pretty interesting use case because you can, uh, if you have a compatible interface, it helps, right? You can point your randomized inputs at the legacy, imp uh, at the legacy implementation, point them at your implementation and then compare the results. And if they're the same, you don't have to worry. It's like having a thousand monkeys at typewriters you know, banging on the same thing. It should, it should 
uh, have the same result regardless of the system that's being used. You could also compare implementations of your own stuff like single and multi-threaded multi um, applications or uh, implementations of the same type of application or um, testing some optimization to make sure that it doesn't matter what, uh, what input you give it, it still behaves correctly. And sometimes, especially if you're doing some optimization, it's very easy for a bug to slip by uh, where you like send a weird string that somehow you know, breaks your application or, or causes a uh, memory to, to overflow or something like that. Like, anything could happen with this. And in fact, the library I mentioned, FastCheck, actually caught several bugs from uh, in, in popular JavaScript uh, libraries because it tried to use them with really weird Unicode strings and that somehow broke uh, encoding, encoding routines or, or something like that. One, one concept that comes with um, property-based tests is the concept of a shrinker. A shrinker, not the shrink, not the psychologist, is exists for when the test fails. And different libraries have different implementations of shrinkers. And usually it's the smallest input that still fails the test. And this, I'll give you an example. Uh, can we switch to this one? Can we switch to this one, please? Sorry about that. So uh, we have an example of a couple of tests. This these tests were designed to fail, um, and I'm going to give you an example of what is a, a, pro a property-based test that fails. So our implementation, or rather our, our test, generates an array of integers up to a size 200. And we're specifically saying we don't want a shrink here. So what happens when you run this, uh, the code is, is buggy. It, it doesn't give you the right uh, length for, for anything that's uh, greater than three or greater than two. And what you see here is that it says property failed after one test. It says, well, it failed with this array. And it's not very, it, it is true and it, it's a good test uh, or a good result to have, but it's not totally helpful. And again, if, you, if I save and it runs again, it's going to say, well, it failed now with this uh, array as well. It's a different one. Uh, you also get, by the way, uh, if you want to, if you need to replicate a failing test, it doesn't happen all the time, sometimes you get this stuff that's only caught like once in a thousand runs or even less, uh, you get to see it. And if you pop this seed into your tests, you'll get to replicate the exact conditions that, that generated this input. And again, you, but you get a, different, get a different array. And if you try to run it again, you, you get an even longer array. It's again, useful, but a bit hard to, to debug. So, if instead of doing this, you use the shrink, that's in this case the shrink is provided by, uh, by your um, testing framework, it always gives you, first of all, it always gives you something that's consistent, but also it gives you the smallest 
input that fails this test, and the smallest one is an array that's three elements long. So you know that this will always fail the test, and you then go to the test, oh, okay, I'm, I have this you know, stupid condition here that's causing things to, to fail. And you remove it, run the test, and it passes. Everyone's happy. So, uh, not about shrinkers in testing libraries. Some, like this one, will try to shrink your inputs uh, automatically. You don't have to do anything. It'll try to, and, and different, different frameworks have different concepts of what smaller means. Smaller can be the smallest integer. Could also be the one closest to zero. So it's, it's an implementation detail of the library. Uh, and some libraries don't provide or don't give you shrinkage of, of inputs out of the box. Sometimes you have to provide a, an inverse function of your generator, um, generator function so that you can help the library trace back you know, the smallest possible value from, from a failure. In this case, you know, it's pretty good. You don't have to do anything. If you want to not have a shrink, and there are some valid use cases for this, for example, if shrinking an input doesn't give you any uh, value, because this, this process still takes some time to, to do. And if you want your, a faster test, you may want to disable shrink if, if you know that the inputs can't be made smaller or can't be made meaningfully smaller. Uh, another example, for example, with daytime, again, a test that was designed to fail. Uh, we want something that's always in, in the past. Uh, I can give you an example, a running example. Let me silence this first. Oh, live coding. So without shrink, it will give you uh, a date that fails that's not in the past, but it's year 2161, or you run again, uh, 2150, et cetera, et cetera. But if you use a shrink, it will always tell you the current date, consistently. I mentioned language support a while back. So the granddaddy of these um, property-based testing libraries is Haskell with Quick, quick Check. Uh, it was more or less immediately adopted by other functional languages. Uh, Clojure, uh, Elm, F-sharp, uh, Scala. There's, Scala is pretty well known. And JavaScript has a couple of libraries. Um, previous versions, if you, if you watch a previous version of this talk, I used JS Verify examples. JS Verify is one of the libraries that does not provide uh, automatic shrinkage, so you have to actually give the, the inverse function of your generator so that you can, you can help the library along. And FastCheck, which is written in TypeScript, has got uh, great support for types. Uh, you can probably see it here if you so when you create a let's look at this one so we have a property that takes an integer mapped to something this a value because of TypeScript uh, it knows it's oh come on it knows it's a number. I, it's pretty clever. So to recap, why might you want to use property-based testing? You want to be sure uh, that you get better coverage by using gener uh, randomly generated inputs because you're testing a wide array of uh, inputs without having to write multiple duplicated tests for this. It's, it's multiple tests written as a single one. 
So it's much easier to maintain, and much simpler to, to understand. A little note about coverage. Uh, coverage is a useful metric, but don't always believe it. You can have coverage that's 100%, that's perfectly acceptable, and also you can have coverage that's 100% and still has bugs in implementation. Uh, especially, or more common, if, if you have a bug in like a side effect that you're not exactly testing, code is still being exercised, 100% coverage, but there's a bug in the application. It's, it's not a replacement for example-based tests. It complements them. Uh, sometimes you, it's, it's the easiest and most easier to understand and maintain to have a concrete example of how, the, of how your system works rather than you know, provide this general abstract uh, property about it. So don't, don't go and try to rewrite all your unit tests as property-based ones. Uh, it might not be necessarily easy or, or even positive. Uh, so not practical, it's a full replacement. Uh, you might have to change your testing approach. So it forces you to think about your system in a slightly different way than uh, those concrete examples. So you have to go one level up and think about general behaviors or general properties that your system has. And that's it, thanks, thanks for coming. Any questions? I have, thanks. I have some swag for, Question askers, so. Yeah. So long as the question is not, can I have some? <laughs> yeah, it's not. So how about how much time that these kind of tests increase? For example, my team has a lot of things automated and we want fast stuff, testing right. fast. So how much time will it increase for this? It, it Depends. <laughs> it, it can increase a bit because each, so if you don't configure your testing library, uh, it will try to run your tests 100 times, for example, to generate 100 objects for, for your tests to run. So that's the same thing as having a single test run 100 times. So that's, that's the overhead you, you get. You can configure it to have uh, fewer or m even much fewer tests than, than, than 100. Um, it's, it's really up to you. That's why it's also not a practical replacement because if you're doing TDD and you are, you're relying on code being, or tests to be running all the time, uh, it, it might slow down your feedback uh, cycles and you went in short. Yeah. My question started because I started to implement, because of the coverage that you said, it's 100% is not telling you that everything is tested, stat, tested. So we started to use mutation tests to try to figure it out, but on front-end project, JavaScript is really slow. So most of the team started like, eh, I don't know, I, I want to wait for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get a report of this. Yeah. And uh, we did a lot of work to, well, to try to solve it, but it's not perfect yet, but we tried to reduce it by using Git uh, differences, so it, we will only run tests based on the, di uh, the different files that we changed, but even so, it still takes a long time. You, you mentioned mutation tests. Yeah. Is this, this what taking longer or are you talking about property-based testing? Uh, we never use okay. property-based, but They're different. with mutation, yeah, but uh, it takes time, right. and uh, my team starts to think, okay, this is really necessary because if you start to say, okay, because it takes a long time, let's start to do a daily run. But if you do a daily run, it's not like mandatory when you push to master. Right. So if it's not mandatory, I'll do it tomorrow. Right. And tomorrow, next week, next month. That's, that's one of the drivers to keep, you know, yeah. so putting things off and not, tested, not running but tests. Really fast to know, to not lose yeah. so much time. So property-based tests are different from mutation tests that you mentioned. Mutation tests, are, is, is anyone here familiar with, with what mutation tests are? Anyone? So, mu Sorry. <laughs> mutation, mutation tests are really interesting because it's, mutation tests are tests for your tests. And it's, so the way a mutation test works, and it's very slow, that's why you're having struggling with that, is that 
mutation tests go and break your application code so that they can check whether the tests are working. So if your mutation test successfully breaks your application code but no unit tests fail, then you have a, a, a lack of coverage or you have a problem with your insufficient testing. Uh, but it, they're, they're different things. And mutation tests are very, very slow. They can be very, very, very slow. So, yeah. Any, any other questions? First of all, thank you for the talk. Really, really cool. Uh, my question is, how about those uh, bugs you said that came up one every 10,000 times, one every 100,000 times? Um, I, I understand that if you keep developing and you're going to run these tests, let's say, 10 times, so you're going to get 10,000 tests uh, if you run 100 tests on every time. Uh, but how do you make sure that those bugs don't get to production? I mean, I understand that once you find them, you can go back to regular TDD and make them a single case that you're going to test. But how can you be sure that you're actually, you can never be sure because it's random, but how do you minimize the chance of bringing them into production? These rare, rare, rare cases that we all know that come over every once in a while. Well, you can't. That's <laughs> 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 uh, but when, when they do come up, uh, if, if you go on your Jenkins log or something, you'll, you'll see them, you'll see why the build failed, and you'll be able to write possibly a, a normal example-based test just to exercise that particular condition or configure your, your property-based test to always trigger that, that particular condition. Some libraries might, might you, you can configure your, your tests to, to use a, a specific seed. That's how you, you're able to repro reproduce. So the, I don't know if you've noticed in, in the example, um, this counter example here as an associated seed. And this number is what's going to uh, allow you to rerun the test under these, these conditions. But it's like uh, property-based tests were created in part to address the sort of situations where you have something that's that's an expect you, you weren't anticipating it. it. You need something that's randomized to eventually maybe catch it. And you know, if, if you do catch it, then you, you're on your way to a slightly better product. Uh, might not, not happen all the time, but it's, it's still something. Any more questions? Who wants a rubber duck? Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Uh, is performance a, a valid property to test? Like if I'm refactoring a code, can I check that the new implementation is faster than the old one in all cases? I've, I've, I've thought about it. Maybe. Um, it depends on how you're testing it because it, this, this could run in different environments or in different conditions. So running on your laptop is not running on Jenkins for example. So you might want to p set a threshold for, for, your, um, for your performance. Like you have, uh, you have to run this under two seconds. And you can definitely do that. You can time your, your execution. And if it runs under two seconds, fine. Otherwise, you throw, it fails the test, basically. So yeah, it, you, you could potentially do that. Um, and you can compare. You can comp yeah. That's uh, again the, the the example of comparing legacy and and uh, refactored implementations. That's that's again a good scenario because you're not just testing uh, whether the, the results are correct. You are also y you might also want to test that the new implementation is faster than the old one. Right. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned earlier TypeScript, uh, and I wanted to ask you uh, one thing: is regarding the private functions, because sometimes you, uh, overall, you're not you you can't test them directly, or you, you, sh have you to shouldn't test them directly. Yeah, I, I also <laughs> I also uh, I also read about uh, about that, and people were saying that you sh you probably have some public method that you can test that invokes that private function, and that's the method that you should be willing to test. So, you agree with that vision? Uh, so you should have you should only test your public functions. You should only test the surface okay. uh, of of your system. Okay. 
And you, if you ad adopt something like TDD, that's exactly how you build the system. You build it from the outside in. You design it from the outside in. So you start by writing a test that exercises the API in a certain way. And it doesn't really matter what the implementation details are for the test. The test should not care about that. So whether the implementation relies on one specific private function or two or none, it doesn't matter, shouldn't matter for the test because we want to be free. And the reason for this is that we want to be free to refactor your application without breaking the tests. Right? Uh, if, you, if you're inspecting a private, if you use some sort of you know, reflection uh, mechanism that some languages provide to inspect uh, inspect calls to, to a private function or you use some sort of mocking to make sure that certain things happen. Sometimes it's useful. Uh, sometimes it's... So w one example where it might be useful to expose something that's an internal implementation detail and expose it for the sake of tests is if, if, if there's a combinatorial explosion of, of uh, um, outcomes. A good example of this is like validation functions. You might want to, to test your validation functions uh, independent of the rest, but that, that's something that you can inject as a dependency, for example, in, as part of the API for your, for your system, and then test the rest uh, in isolation. But when you build the, the thing, you're writing the API for your public methods and your public classes. And it doesn't matter because if you are refactoring something, making it better, not changing anything, and because you don't want to change anything, you also don't want your tests to break for reasons that are not good. Like suddenly your test breaks, oh, you're not calling function X, Y, Z. Why not? I might not, might not need it. It's, it's an implementation detail. Right? Yes, yes, but uh, there, are, there are some, uh, there are some times where you, you, you may have something that's uh, kind of critical. I mean, you, you wouldn't, I I I can understand what you say wh when you when you say that you can you should only test public functions because that's the the, the, the ones that will be actually used and the ones that the, where the user uh, the users or better yet the developers can interact with, mm -hmm. but uh, there are some situations where you you ha you know that your uh, public function uh, is failing, but it's internally it's called it's invoking two or three int private functions. This is a, a an example a s scenario. It's not obviously mm -hmm. real, but it can happen. And you have to know which of these steps has failed because you may uh, be calling two external libraries and one private function, and you have to know if the problem is in your external libraries because you're not calling them correctly, uh, or in your private function, and you have no way of telling that because you only know that the public function is failing. Uh, I think I understand what you're, where you're coming from. That but at the same time, you don't want to expose that function publicly because yes. there is no use for it. It's yeah. only used on that scenario. It, it, it kind of depends. Sometimes, it, it, if it's if it's the the most practical thing to do, like you have to admit, this is a trade-off, right? So, the convenience of testing uh, or mocking an internal function for the sake of tests is going to carry some some uh, problems in the future. So if you want to refactor your code, it might break the test and you'll have to go and fix the test. It can be particularly net. So one, one example of this, that's actually very common practice, is, is React component tests. And there's a library called Enzyme that allows you to do a shallow render of your interface. And it only renders one level of components. And then you're free to say in your test that say, okay, this component is made up of other smaller components. I'm not rendering them, I'm not testing them, I'm just making sure that they're there. This is, is very convenient, it's, that's why it's so widely adopted. Problem is, what if you want to change those components? It's going to break the test. Even if functionally everything is still the same, it's still going to fail the test because it's going to say, oh, you replace, I don't know, uh, this um, React Bootstrap component with something else that's, that does the same thing, but it comes from a different library. It breaks the test even though functionally everything is still the same. And that's extra work for you because you now have to go and fix the test. So it's a trade-off. 
you, you accept convenience on one side, you may want to, um, or you, you, you may be forced to, to have to deal with the consequences of that later. Again, it depends. It's, but it's, it's not uh, like you shouldn't test internal implementation details, but sometimes you do. Uh, and it's, it's always a trade off. You have to think of what the consequences might be or what you might be prepared to deal with in terms of maintaining tests for this. Over Thank you. Anyone else? Someone else was raising their hand. <laughs> okay, you get something too. Just because you had a question. <laughs> Anyone else? I have to get rid of this crap, so. <laughs> I didn't quite understand the, the shrink part that you explained. How do you, can you show the code again? It's just to make the question. So the sh it's hard for me to explain the shrinkage except in, ge in generic terms because each library implements shrinkage in slightly different ways. And I'm not, I don't know the internals of fast check. I don't know how it actually is generating those, those shrunk values. I know what it does or not, I know what it's supposed to do only. And uh, so what, what happens is you have a, a property that you want to test and you feed it, you're feeding it like a, a random um, value. Uh, I had an example with the, with the arrays. So you have an arbitrary arrays of how many you know, elements and one particular array fails the test. Now it could, it could be a huge array, it could be a thousand element array. And you're going to get that in logs. If you don't shrink, it's going to basically dump that in the log. But the library might, might be a little clever and it might try to, going from that error, try to find a smaller array that still fails the test, that still fails the same test. So it tries to go back from, from that um, value and try, for example, try to create smaller arrays that contain more or less the same values, maybe. Uh, or if it's a number, for example, if it's if you, if one fails and it or, or something that's greater than one fails, it's going to bring down the number until the tests pass, and and then it looks at the previous failure and gives you that. So instead of getting a thousand element array, and in the output log for this, it might give you a three element array, and you know that anything greater than three or bigger than three is going to be uh, an issue. I'm not sure if that's clear enough. You're ready. You're ready, Evan. <laughs> You'll get a duck. I have a question. <laughs> I have a, um, so say you, you, you're making a game and you randomize some stuff. Right. Like you randomize a hand, you randomize a board, you randomize whatever you're throwing at the player. Um, you showed us cases where you are randomizing integers, arrays, collections, numbers, strings, whatever. Um, does, do these libraries go about randomizing my own objects or uh, passing yes. that that seed into my objects so that they, you know what I mean? Somehow not make, make my code generate the same object from... Not in implementation, uh, but for the tests, yes, you can build arbitrary objects uh, because you can compose the, the data structures that, that yeah. you use. But, but the thing is, uh, if I run 100 tests and I want to redo that test based on this seed, Mm -hmm. If my code is absolutely random, it will ran it will give a hundred different objects from the first time, even if I use the same seed as in the first test. You know what I mean? You're I'm trying to repeat the test, but because my right. library is generating a new hand every time, it's going to be different. It's going to be different. Right. Uh, how do we go it's about? Tricky. Yeah. It's, right? it's trickier. How do we do? How do we go about it? It, it might not so be a property that you want you, to test. If you move your randomness to like the edges of your program, you can try to get a arbitrary random that you pass to your program, and then, yeah. Yeah, you can you can you can have your random number generator be a, a an external dependency that you inject into your code, and then you pass a mock that 
always return something that you can control and, and that, but if you're thinking about property, te uh, properties about random stuff, then maybe don't focus on the randomness. Th focus on the things that don't change. And that's, that's probably a more reliable property to test when, when, you, when you're doing it. Uh, even randomness, sometimes it might make sense. So for example, if you're testing a, uh, for example, cards, uh, like it's, it's not a foolproof property to test, but at least most, in most instances, shuffling a deck of cards twice will give you different, um, different results. It's possible that it's the same one, but it's super unlikely, right? So that could be a, a, a property that, that you might want to test that you have a more or less reliable uh, shuffling algorithms, for example. But um, it's this, you, you have the same problems if you're doing instance-based tests because you're testing something that's random uh, could be here, could be you know, someplace else. Uh. Usually what I, what I do on usual TDD is I find a bug with a particular board or a particular hand, mm -hmm. and I have a setter for oh. that class. I set the board or I set the hand, and I know that in this board, if I correct it, if I get the expected result from whatever I'm doing, I have probably... Yeah, you recreate the conditions where exactly. the, the bug exists. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That could be the same thing with random number generator. You inject it as a dependency. It throws out always the same thing, a reliable thing, and you test it for that condition. Only. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Yes? Yes. Uh, for me, it's not entirely clear when should we use this type of testing. So imagine I have a, a service that receives a complex type, and it's not just uh, numbers or strings, it's a more general thing. Complex types are, are perfectly fine in this kind of thing. It depends on what you're trying to, to build. You can build, you can build complex uh, objects with, um, I had an example here early on where you could build something that's a little more complex. This, this is a very simple example of what you can do. You can actually go crazy with this and create really complex objects. Uh, some libraries will even give you primitives to create random, randomized JSON payloads, for example. Um, it's, it's like the sky's the limit here. You can, you can, you can have some, some of it could be fixed, some of, some of it could be randomized, some of it could be could go through a map or a filter so that you can control more or less the, the kind of results that you want to put there. It's so, so I could use this type of testing for to doing my functional tests in an automated way. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, who's an who's an Excel? Anyone here? Where's Excel? There you go. <laughs> You have a question? It's not here? It's not on the list? Wait, which one is it? Test lectro test tutorial. Test lectro test tutorial. I don't know. You get a deck of yeah. icebreaker cards. <laughs> All right, unless there are any more questions? So randomized inputs for the crowd. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>